Hello everyone, welcome. Glad you are here. I am so excited about this lesson, by the way. Um, I had my, I have a third grader and I had her play around with it last night and she did not want to go to bed. So that got me very, very, very excited. Um, so welcome, glad you're here. Um, I had shared the link to the slides in the chat box. And um, what I'd ask is that you come on down to slide either four or five and just share a little something about yourself. If you have images, pictures, things like that, definitely celebrate um, anything else that, you know, might personalize it and let us know you a little bit more. Um, and I will share mine. Um, I am so excited. I'm a Girl Scout leader and uh, the girls are finally able to meet in person. And there's these math in nature badges that just came out this year. And so they got to play with um, hexagons and squares and triangles to try and make these really cool tessellations. Um, so it just made like my mathy uh, side get very excited. So um, yeah, I'm kind of running on this really good mood right now. How's everyone else doing? Um, definitely share us on slide four and five. Uh, Raha, how's it going? Hi, Teresa. How are you? Good. Um, I'm just, I'm not really a fall person like everyone is, but I really like Halloween decor. <laughs> so I'm ready to buy as many skulls as I want and have the excuse to have it around my house and not look like a weirdo. <laughs> Love it. Happens to be my favorite holiday of the year. Um, Laura, how's it going? How's your, um, your, tell us about this fourth grade perception of estimation. Buenos dias. Good morning, everybody. So um, I, in my classroom, I kind of do like a modified successes and celebrations. We do like, what was your favorite part of the week? Every Friday, that's like a more fourth grade style thinking of like reflecting on the week. And one of my fourth graders, we've been doing estimation and rounding. One of my fourth graders wrote that the reason she likes rounding this week, that was her favorite part of the week, was because she didn't have to get the correct answer, which I thought was like, well, no, I think she probably meant she didn't have to get the exact answer. But I just thought like the way that she viewed it was just hilarious. She likes estimation because she doesn't have to get the right answer. <laughs> oh, I, I. I love that child already. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing. Um, there's um, others coming in again. Yeah, just use any of the space on slide four and five. It's a chance for us to get to a little, know a little bit more about you and teachers need to share successes and celebrations more like we need that in our lives. Um, someone else did that. They do successes and celebrations every morning in their four or five class. Um, what's your favorite part of it? Any tips for us? Hi, this is um, Jerry from Seattle, Washington area. I love it. I, first, I was worried that it's going to take up so much time, but they're reading, they're writing, and they're and we're getting to know each other. So it's a hundred percent awesome. Love it. Yeah, and you know, if there's a nice part about when we go into breakout rooms later that there's just a little bit of this. The ice breaks up just a little bit, just enough. I've, I've found them to be so nice. So glad that glad to hear that you're doing them. Lisa, how is Mathagon with your geometry students? We just, they were working on an assignment. And when the first one finished, I said, come here, Jacob, I want you to play. And I just let him play on my Chromebook at, or my computer. And as other kids got finished, they gathered around him. And he had four or five boys before he was, before it was time to go. So just playing, I think it's, we're going to find some benefits with the geometry kids. And I think we'll probably try with the, the lower kids do multiplication by hearts and start working on multiplication. Absolutely. Well, I hope today's activity also will give you some ideas for working with multiplication. Um, and thanks everyone for, for um, putting comments there on those slides. Let's jump right in. Somebody asked a few weeks ago, could we do a lesson on prime and composite numbers? And so th that has been on my mind for a while. And why on earth do we teach this? What is the point of it? And so as my mathematician brain goes, I go right up to upper level mathematics and I try and think about like, when would you use this in college math and beyond? And then let's step it back, 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 back and figure out what are the important things to teach. So uh, that's what today's lesson's kind of around. And 
spoiler alert, at the end, um, I will bring it all the way up to college level math for anyone who's curious about the connections there. Um, so um, our math routine is one of my favorites. We've seen it in uh, Math or Days before, and it's on slide six is where it starts. It's called All of These, None of These. And the way it works is you grab any slide below and put your name in the yellow box that reserves it for you, lets other people know that, hey, you would like to work in this space. And you can create any rule you want, but keep it secret for now. And there's some numbers off to the side, numbers that have this secret rule in common you put in the oval, and numbers that don't have that in common go outside the oval and see how many numbers you can place. Again, you can come up with any secret rule you want. Um, just put your name in one of those yellow boxes and um, yeah, start moving those numbers in and out. See if you can come up with a secret rule. You can also choose to not have to use all the numbers. All right, it looks like people have a great head start on, on coming up with their secret rule. What I'm gonna ask is that you go to the slide below yours. If you're the very last one, uh, that's me, of course, uh, then you would go cycle up to the top. So go to the one below yours. And this time, just use a text box to try and put some other number, either inside their oval or outside their oval. So we don't have the pretty pictures this time, just a random text box, but see if you can think about what the rule might be. And if you finish your first slide, you can welcome to keep moving down to your the, the other slides and see if you can guess their rule. Thank you. 
and then try to do at least one more. Again, just put a number in a text box, either inside or outside. And it, it's tricky because you got to analyze the rule and then you got to find another example of it. So be patient with yourself. All right, and then you can go back to your initial slide. You can use that teal box to tell us like, what is your secret rule? Please solve it for some of us. We're dying to know what it was. Um, and Amy on slide 11, you had a lot of activity on there. People are really trying to guess it. Um, would you mind kind of sharing us your rule and see if any of those numbers need to be adjusted from what people thought they should be? Do you want me to speak? I'm sorry. <laughs> sure, yeah. Can you tell us what your rule was on slide 11? I saw there's a lot of activity there, so you've yeah, got me curious. I, I was thinking um, of multiples of three. Um, the younger grades, they might be counting by threes, and once they get into uh, more of a multiplication, they um, it's more of a uh, multiples of three. Cool. Here, I thought you just picked all the ones with green in it. Um, very cool. And so I would expect 27,381 to maybe also have green or also be a multiple of three. Um, feel free to move any of those numbers if, if we didn't guess correctly. Um, and um, Lydia, you were on slide 15. I also saw color, but can you tell us what your rule was on slide 15? Um. Slide 15, yes. Um, so mine's very similar to slide 11. It's all orange, um, but multiples of two, including two. Ah, so you included two. Why was that so important to bring up? Well, only because I saw the next one. I, I don't know, are there two Teresa's or is it yours where you had not included all the greens you'd left out one of the greens, um, which is three, the prime. So I was wondering, you know, like, um, if we should just make it, I wanted to make it all orange. I wanted to have at least one orange in the circle and then it could be inside the oval. Awesome. So what we've done in this activity is, first of all, every kid gets to be correct. So Lara, the kiddo that wrote that little sticky note, like this, this lesson's for them, right? Like you get to be correct no matter what you choose to do. Um, but in addition, we're analyzing it, we're trying to develop somebody else's ideas. Um, but what's really cool with it is um, we're starting to develop a, a need for vocabulary. I hear some of us using words like prime or factor or at least or not enough. So we're, we're having a purpose to say that so that we can distinguish between them, but in a very informal way. Um, so that kind of primes us for our rich task. Um, let's move down to slide 19. I'm going to go ahead and, uh, have us start off with our problem solving oath here. I'll say it out loud. If you pledge to do this today, just type your name in the chat box there. It says, I insert your name, promise to try my best. I will make sense of patterns and numbers. I will use manipulatives and drawings. I will make mistakes. I will ask questions. I will listen to other ideas. I will stay engaged by always trying to find another solution or representation. I am a problem solver. I make the world a better place. If you want to take that oath, go ahead and put your name there in the chat box. And last week we had David Porras uh, from Mathagon uh, come in, you know, teach us a little bit about it. And I was inspired. So this is using Mathagon. And our task is on slide 20. It, there's a, a game, we'll call it the rectangle game. And in the rectangle game, players take turn choosing a number on the game board. They find the different ways that you can make a rectangle and they score a point for each different way. So for example, Sarah picked 100. 
because that's the biggest number on the game board. And she found that there were nine different rectangles she could make um, with the number 100. And so she scored nine points. But Zara found another number on the game board that would give her more points than Sarah. What number could it be? To get your minds kind of primed for how to use this, I have links to Mathagon. There's a very short little video on slide 21 that I'm sharing now, but you can also um, watch on your own. There's a slider that lets you move these tiles, in this case, 100. So kids can explore it without like really having to think about things like multiples, factors, primes, composites, things like that. They can just explore. Um, then they can use the copy button, uh, scrolling around with it. But you can use that to just see how many different uh, rectangles you can make. And when you're in breakout rooms, you can share your screen if you like, or you can just kind of um, explore with it to see the different ways. But the important thing is that it makes a rectangle. None of these not quite or rectangles with a bite taken out of it. Alrighty, so. Teresa, can I ask you a clarifying question? You said that um, Sarah picked 100 because it's the uh, most, the highest number on the game board. Uh -huh. How many tiles do we have on the game board? Great 100? question. Yes, if you come on down to your group slides, I'll show oh, us on sorry. slide 22. No, I'm, you primed me for it. Thank you. I'm on slide 22. Um, and what we have here is the example. So Sarah picked 100. So her little uh, piece went down on 100 and she scored nine points. What we wanna know is what number Zara could have picked that would give her more than nine points. And she has every other one to choose from. Um, the cool thing is each of these numbers, if you click them, it'll go to a Mathagon with that number, like there's already 60 here, so you can be playing around with it to see how many points you can score. Any other Thank questions you. before we start? Could This is Lynn, could you clarify how you score points? Uh, great question. Um, on slide 20 is kind of a picture of Sarah's screen. She moved those 100 tiles in all different ways, and she found that there were nine different rectangles. So she scored nine points. There was a 100 by one, a one by 100, a 10 by 10, a five by four, a four by five. So all the different types of rectangles and their flipped versions can count also. All right. Well, if you do have questions, please let me know. I'm really hoping that this will be a super fun game for us. We are in um, breakout rooms of two for almost everybody. Um, and uh, so those rooms are open now. Feel free to head into them and I'm going to come in too and, and keep playing with you all. Doing well, thank you. How about yourself? Good, thank you. I'm very excited because my um, term one break begins today. Oh, that's right. <laughs> I saw your. I saw. Um, I yeah. put a little notice. I hope you enjoy your break. You yeah. are the one that um, is on break yeah. right now. Yeah. Did this number investigation like we played with square tiles, and I had kids investigate numbers. So uh -huh. this is perfect. Oh, that's so cool. So Teresa, Jerry and I both on our own wanted to select the number 24. Oh, I like 24 too, because there's a whole game about it, right? Um, yeah, <laughs> so true. how many points would Zara had picked if they if uh, she picked 24? We're working on it. Ah, cool. It's working on it. <laughs> Um, and Mathagon also has that copy button, um, which I found once the kiddos learned where it is, they liked it because they could keep making more and more and more and showing all the ones that they could do. 
And where's the copy button on the side? Yeah, if you select your little um, pieces at the very mm -hmm. bottom, it will appear. There's a delete button and a copy ah, button. I see it. My webcam was covering it. Do. And that's the part where my daughter spent all evening, like she would not go to bed. She's like, no, there's got to be another one. And she'd move it real slowly, like, oh, why won't it just go there? <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, my kiddos oh, get is... to be the guinea pigs. Okay, I'm not seeing the copy button. I select it. It's definitely selected. Um, oh, got it. Never mind. Oh, yeah, got it. Good. It's interesting that it counts good. if it's vertical or horizontal. You know, so that was one of the, the questions in here, like, should it count for both ways? And a really interesting part of it is if you look at the way the number one can be represented, um, if we count the vertical and horizontal, at least prime numbers get two points, but the number one gets only one point. And so it really becomes the odd one out and it brings up a lot of great discussion about is prime, is one a prime number or not? Got it. That is good. I did something similar, but it was with a uh, graph paper, and we would count all the squares and cut them out. And mm -hmm. in the end, we pasted all these rectangles on a uh, const construction piece of paper. And so that we can see how many rectangles can we make for the number, say, 24. Mm -hmm. And that's where we're starting to see, oh, look at the square numbers and look at all the ones only, mm -hmm. for example, one. Like, hmm, it. It's just one. And then we start talking about rules or what does yep. it mean? It's exactly what my class just did on Friday. <laughs> oh, yay. <laughs> we've, been, we've been investigating for a while, but we finally have, you know, noticed and wondered about what, what we've been working on. Do you all ever do these things? When I remember learning this in school, we had to make factor rainbows. Um, so we'd have mm -hmm. one on the far left and like, let's say 100 on the far right. And then we'd start working our way towards the middle and essentially we would list out all the factors. Is that is that something that people teach these days? Uh, it's definitely out there. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, it is something that can be helpful because it's, it's nice to have the, the partner, right? The factor pair and mm -hmm. um, to make a rainbow is always fun. And yes. one of the neat things about this is because you can stretch these tiles, it starts to build a little bit of mathematical organization. So mm -hmm. let's try the one by something. Let's try the two by something. Let's stretch mm -hmm. it to the three by something. And it kind of gives them that um, organizational skill that would lead to more abstract notations like the rainbow. Yeah, I like my kids to figure that theory out. Like, how do you know you have them all? Yeah. What do you think the strategy? How do you know? Are you sure? <laughs> then they'll come, somebody will come up with that, which is always fun. Wicked cool. <laughs> awesome. Well, thanks for the discussion. I'm going to go pop in another group. Thank you, right. Teresa. Mm -hmm. So, Jerry. Hi, group. What numbers are you exploring for Zara? 80 and 90. Oh. Are you using we thought we were playing against each other. I'm sorry. You so, I told... <laughs> so this was a two part. Sometimes people prefer to play the game themselves before doing the kind of question. Others vice versa. So you have two sides. You can play it against each other. You can look at the context of it. This activity can go in 17 directions. I really love how it's taking the pressure away from finding um, the factors in deciding how to build the array because, like you said, for third grade, I'm trying to figure out how to introduce multiplication without having to stress about, like, former knowledge. So I'm, I'm, I'm excited everyone to use this to build arrays because for me, multiplication is arrays. And in fourth grade, it's a little bit easier because they already know how to build an array. Like it has to be a rectangle, but this will help them visually see what I'm trying to say. I'm excited. You know, um, one other thing that it does is it helps them to use multiplication for non-rectangular numbers. So like 
the mm -hmm. number um, 61 could be represented as five or 10 times six plus one. So they can kind of like deconstruct those numbers a little bit too. Um, and when they see the little tiles moving, um, some of that like deconstruction kind of comes naturally. Yeah, I really like this. Oh yeah, something of course. I've not explored Matagon with the students, but I feel it's a very interesting tool after the last session. I feel a lot could be done with Matagon. Yeah. And, you know, Teresa, I tried the challenge. You know, you had done, um, you know, the bowling alley challenge right. with us. Yeah. And I tried it with my students. And every time, you know, there was an aha moment. You could actually see the expression. Oh, we found, oh. This also is another pattern. I was like, wow, it was so interesting. So thank you so much, you know. Awesome. For introducing. So I have a question for you. It's a technical question. Go for it. Um, it looks like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Well, I guess it wouldn't work here. So it wouldn't build a race vertically or horizontally it's just building one way so it, i don't have to worry about the commutative property correct so, because then i have more points <laughs> so that's an interesting thing um and i would hope that the kids have a conversation so one side of it is a one by ten is different than a ten by one and the other is no they're exactly the same you just turn it right um, now here's the interesting thing if we look at the um number uh four We've mm -hmm. got a one by four, two by two, and a four by one. We have three different rectangles that it could make. Um, but then if you look at the number six, we have the the one bys and then the mm -hmm. two bys. So six actually now has four. So that makes six a little bit more powerful in a sense than the number four. Right. Now here's the cool right. thing is the number one it only has one way. You can't make a horizontal and a vertical, which makes number one like a horrible piece for this game. Yeah. And it brings up the discussion, is one a prime number? Right. Yeah. That's really interesting. Thank you. Yeah, so I don't have answers. I just keep asking the kids those questions. <laughs> <laughs> I have some no, vocabulary I, I... I want them to get to, but I don't um, I don't necessarily have a... a an exact answer that they're trying to get to. It's more of this will lead them into the questions that they should ask. And, um, you know, why do mathematicians say this? Well, because we argued and we decided we needed to, right. like, you know, make a rule. <laughs> yeah. Oh, did you, no, Rana, did you find one that is more? 80 had 10 rectangles? That's cool. Yes. One, two, is it because eight is an even number compared to nine? That is why. Oh, that's another question. Do even numbers have an unfair advantage here? Oh, yes. I was thinking of the number 24 because sometimes I, when we do multiples and factors, I like to give them 24 because that has different factors. But that doesn't necessarily mean it has a lot of rectangles. It just means it has different factors. So Braha, mm. what you're talking about is that college level math. Those are called highly composite numbers, are in this case, super win the game numbers. Um, there's okay. a couple other out there other than 24, but use that same thinking to see if you can find them. Okay. I just have to go back to my, when I build those worksheets, how many <laughs> factors I want you to find. Right? That's awesome. Yeah. Cool. We'll keep it up. I'm going to go check out some other groups. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It has. Oh, I got one that's bad. Two times seven. Oh, this is a bad one. <laughs> How do you split your your um, your rectangles to make them? I, I'm not doing that. I don't even have math gone no. open. I'm just using <laughs> mental copies. Yeah. And then you can recolor the copy. Oh. Let me try to go find this in oh. math. I just tried. I just found something. I recolored the copies and then I. Um, and Lisa, you can actually click right on those numbers and it will bring okay, you on. like Hello. to the poly Hello, pack. Yeah. 
Hold on. That's the, I, we knew we were missing something. So we clicked on like, like our 98. Uh-huh. Right. Oh, wait. It's not. Oh, oh there you might it have is. a little okay. chip on it. But yeah, if you click on the number, it'll automatically like, kids, like it's meant for third grade. Is, is it okay quarter. to put the chip on? I mean, we were just doing that to show our thing. Yeah. It, the and downside is it doesn't link it anymore because like the chip's on top, but um, I haven't figured Let's out see. how to go around so, that. So, all right, I feel a little... Um, I feel better now. <laughs> well, because I'm I, cheating. I, I took the math again. Sorry, you'll see on your 96. That's me. I took it and I did the plus next to split tiles and I copied them because then I was trying to divide it into like physically divide it and I can't figure out how to select like four times um one two three four five six seven eight nine so four times nine for example and the orange triangle over on math again so how do i work math again to um i just want to select four yeah right, so, so. Oh, what, what did i just go to oh I, my god that was me lisa that's not you okay okay good <laughs> i just okay, shared good. my screen when i clicked on the 98 um it, it won't the, give you any more than 98. So like you have to like, you have to wiggle it around. How, how do you get them skinny that like, I can't, how do you get a one by 98 on your screen? Yeah. So uh, in, you, yeah, I don't really see it all, but I grabbed this little like yeah. semicircle and right. so I can make that. I can scroll so down. So you can't see it. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, you can scroll down. But then when oh. I'm done, there's a little button at the bottom that lets you copy which is the way to preserve your work. And so now I can kind of rotate. try Where other ones. Tori, so I'm just cheating. I'm just using mental math to do all my, so, I'm using uh, where, I wonder where's if we reframe button? that we're cheating to you've discovered uh, I'm, I'm, a generalization and now you're using yeah. your strategy, right? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> okay, I'm not using the tool at hand. <laughs> That's what I should say. Well, uh, what grades do you teach? So, I, Lynn's, She's good. What grade do you teach, Land? Could you say? I do ESL. ESL. Um, you know, second language, multilingual learners. Second, so I'm um, I'm looking at like the language for math. Um, what, what grades do you uh, work with? K twelve. Oh <laughs> so, cool. goodness! But this so is good. I, I well, I'm a WIDA staffer, so I'm double check. I'm like looking, and plus I like math again, so I love this that you're doing this. But I'm like figuring out how to make it work to make it stretch yeah so um in the um in the college level classes they start to look at things called highly composite numbers and they're in this game they're the the super numbers like the ones that are going to give you the best win and the mathematics involved goes way beyond um you know algebra 2 geometry it, it goes into calc and and beyond that and so they would play this exact same game if you're going to be teaching that class as a third grader would play it to learn about primes and composites. So I totally love that. I wonder if you can back up a little totally. <laughs> um, because I want to look at, I'm in math again on slide 36. Okay. And I want to select it all and I want to drag and drop and then create copies. Um, so I have that and then I can't, so I have it there, but I want to, how come you clicked on it and it just selected? Oh, so. My light selects individual ones. Oh, it looks like maybe you had split the tiles on it. Great. Okay. Um, so so you would like select everything to merge them back together. So how do I, where do I get my merge? Yeah. You, you kind of like. Yeah. Lasso it. Oh, got it. I got it. Mer and then I'm going to merge one, two, three, four. I'll merge those and then I'll merge the two. Okay. I'll just keep merging everything. Oh, I'm totally goofing this up. I feel so dumb. Like I can't get this. No, you're not. You're exploring. Yeah, you're exploring. Absolutely. You're exploring it and you're seeing the different things that are there. Well, I can't get everything to merge. That's my challenge. Because I want to, um, a twelve. I want to put everything together because then I want to start thinking. <sighs> All, right. All right. Will you just demonstrate for me? Because you just clicked on it and naturally it worked. Yeah. Um. I. You know what right. I wonder is if th through the tinkering, um, why don't you? I'm gonna put in the chat box again. This is the original thirty-six. Um. Why don't you see if 
when you go in there, does it just give you like the original? Yes. Okay. And it's it's a bill shaped form. Like it's not a yes, that's what it it's does. It's funky, right? So if you click right. on it once, are they do you have this semicircle on the side? You don't and then I get I only get the squares. So then I was trying to merge everything back together. It didn't and then, save the merge, huh? Oh bummer. I'm gonna then, that one. So I wanna just merge everything. Mm -hmm. merge tiles. And then I wanna merge tiles again. And it won't let me all right, I'm just gonna select everything. Let's see if I can merge it one but, but then when i try to merge it it takes in the two the empty ones <laughs> lynn maybe you should just choose a new number just choose a new number lynn i'm definitely going to troubleshoot that because i i was hoping my you know when i put this together that it'd be um that the merge would stick yeah oh, it didn't stick yeah all right okay i did it with 55 and it worked just great because now i can just do the game and i can do, I can then duplicate. Easy peasy. Okay, it just was something I did. Hmm. Um, and now, oh, I love this. this so fun. All right, I'm on 55. I'm giving up on the other. There you go. And now I can make, all right, I can, so, so mathematically, what is the language I need to, to be able to, like, what is the language so that I would need to use? is what I'm thinking about. Like, not just vocabulary, like, mm -hmm. what is, like, if I'm explaining what I did, I, like, what, what do I need to be able to do? And the neat thing here yeah. is, um, you'll see in our, in our talk, we're going to bring up the informal language that kids would use. Like, this is a bad number, I heard Lisa say, or, um, you know, this is a, an <laughs> awesome number. And we're going to give those the academic language. So this whole exploration starts with that informal language first to give a reason for the academic. Right. Standard one. Oh, cool. Okay. See, I'm... I need y'all your expertise in that. I just know what it feels like to <laughs> I have a bit of a memory issue to not remember like the rules or the names of things and instead have to like go back and find it. So yeah, yeah, because we made a shift explicitly to make sure that you tie together social language and academic language. Uh, social so language. That's what I was trying to call it. There we go. So yeah, like everyday social language. So it's um. And I'm not sure uh, what state you're in, Lisa. What state are you in? Texas. Oh, so that's what sorry. we're doing. We're yeah. crazy. Yeah. yeah. We're just crazy. <laughs> ah. So, but this is super. Okay. Now I'm, I'm doing. Okay. Yeah. So I've got that one. I need to copy that Lisa one. was yeah. totally okay. right with her mental math. That was so good. I've been teaching math so long. It's like, you know, <laughs> it sticks in your head and you. You really have to slow yourself down to think about where the kids are. And I saw somebody who said, don't tell the kids this is easy. It's not easy for them. And yeah, it's easy for you. I tell my kids all the time, y'all, I can do this. I'm, if I grade 100 papers and I see 10 problems, I'm doing 1,000 problems. You're doing 10. Of course it's easy for me. That's how I think of it. Okay, I'm not even going to try this one times 98 because I've got all my little factors. I've got six. Okay, so I'm going to try to go back and see. Hi, Jackson. My cat came over to say hello. Okay, so. This is the power of working together, too. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> Hi, group. Oh, you guys found some cool Hi. numbers here. <laughs> um, all right, so I did 2 and 30, 3 and 20, and then I did 4 and 15. Mm -hmm. 5 and 12. All right, I think I've got all 12 of them. Yay. Perfect. So so far it's 12, right? Yep. Yeah. Yes. So far, twelve is the most that we. I don't think we've gone higher than twelve, right? Not yet. No. <laughs> Not yet. yet. I
Hello, folks, and welcome back. What a joy it was to be on the, a fly on the wall in some of those different groups. Um, the discussions that you had with this, I feel like this activity could be used in so many different lessons just based on what you all brought back. Um, so I'm going to gear our discussion towards um, different ways that you can implement this in your class, but also language and how we build a reason to care about these math terms that we teach. So that's kind of the the gear that we're going to go to here. And um, first of all, because we're teachers, and I know y'all are going to love this, if you join me on slide 38 and below are the remade versions um, to give a little twist. Uh, so on side 38, if you're just working with numbers up to 20, there's a smaller version of it. Um, 39 has rectangles um, through 50, so they don't whirl way off your screen. And then, of course, because I had to use my kiddos with it, we are watching Star Wars right now. And there's variations based on lightsabers. So on slide 40, if I choose the number 66, I can take a lightsaber and take all the rest of the numbers in one direction and those are no longer available for the other player. I have blocked them out. And if you like that one, that's a Jedi rectangle. On slide 41 is the Sith rectangle. That's the lightsaber that goes in two directions. So it's like instead of just a ray, now you have a line. Um, on slide 42 is the Kylo Ren rectangles, which goes kind of in a T. So you pick one and you've taken those ones off for other people. And you can kind of enjoy some strategy that way. And the kids love it for that connection to Star Wars. All right. So let's get into our conversations. I have some social vocabulary on slide 43. And I invite you to, you're welcome to turn on your mic. You're welcome to use the chat. Um, and you can skip around these. Did anyone find the worst board game number? Like the one that was awful. Lisa, tell us about it. What did you find? Oh, um, I think it's so, oh, there you go. I think right off the bat, it's one because it's got one factor. And every other number has at least two factors. Oh, so one's terrible. Um, and Raha, I noticed you put one in there. Is there anything else that you noticed about one? I was thinking that one is so great, like everything is divisible by one. But then when you think about the board game, one is horrible because there's only one rectangle you can make, and that's it. Yes. All right, Jerry, now you're bringing up some other vocabulary in here. Prime numbers are bad. Um, so what makes something a prime, and how is it related to the word bad? Well, you can only get um, two rectangles because you can only count by um, one and by itself. So that just gives you two rectangles. So that's not very helpful. So now, and that's different from the worst board game number. Um, so this one, at least you get two points, right? True. How are, True. like, why is it so important that we make a distinction between the worst and just generally bad ones? I mean, in terms of the game, we're trying to get as many points as we can. So. With one, we get one point. With prime numbers, we get two points. So regardless, two having two rectangles is definitely better than one rectangle. Yeah. Now, I promise if your students play this game, they're never going to ask again, oh, wait, is one a prime or a composite? No, they're just going to be like, that is the worst number on the board. Clearly, we don't need to have a discussion about this. Um, and so that's one of the reasons why we count those flipped rectangles. So I'm going to jump down a little bit to this word flipped rectangle. If you experience that, if you know what I'm talking about, the, the flipped version, um, would you share with us? Again, you can use a chat. You can use your mic. What's a flipped rectangle and why should we care? Are those the one where like the factors are interchangeable using commutative property? So for example, for the rectangle 90, one times 90 is a rectangle, but 90 times one is also a rectangle. 
So then after you left, I started building those to get more points. Ah, and um, did anyone find a number where it didn't have a flipped version? Does everything have a flipped? Hmm. Well, other than one, because we already decided it's the worst. Jerry, can you um, tell us a little bit more about what you wrote there? Um, square numbers are really cool because they make a square and then they have its numbers time, times itself. So they're pretty awesome. And we might even kind of put down here, we've got our four times one, our one times four, and then we have our magical, ooh, two by two. And then we get some like weird, odd number of factors. Um, whereas the ones that all have flipped have even number of factors. So we're bringing up all this um, academic language that we usually teach at the same time. So let's talk about good game board numbers. Let's let's throw them in the chat. This is what you all found out in your exploration. What are some really good ones that you would suggest people use on your game board? Laura, can you tell us about yours multiples of twos, threes, fives, and tens? So in our group, we were talking about why, because we initially, each of us like gravitated to a specific number, why we chose that number. And we talked about like, well, we chose it because we knew that that number was a multiple of lots of numbers, like two, and it was also a multiple of three. And it was also a multiple of five and 10, even better if it was six, because then if it was six, we could scoop up three along the way or eight and we could scoop up four. So we were talking about trying to choose numbers that had lots of multiples within it so we could get more points. Yeah. Amy, go ahead. I think Jerry put uh, what I was going to say in chat. We, our very first number, we tried 24 and it, we didn't win um, uh, if we were to play with uh, Sarah. So for whatever reason, we gravitated towards 24. So we kept using multiples of 24. So we played with 72, we played with 48 and 96. And that's where we're seeing that, huh, I wonder something about 24 or, or is it really the 12 that played a role in it. So yeah, we had fun discovering using 24. <laughs> Yeah, so 24 is a great one. We like to use it on our worksheets, I heard someone else say. I, I'm right there with you. Um, what about the best? Who thinks they found the best one on that game board? You can use other people's work. You can go right up to them and see how many points they got. Ooh, Jerry found 72 and 96. Jerry, how many factors did those have or how many different rectangles? 12. Both of them had 12. Oh. What, is there a smaller number than 96 and 72 that has 12 factors? Oh, Laura found 60. So our best game um, ones on there are 60, 72, and 96. Now, if we were going to send, let's say, homework uh, home, like, you know, investigate this, now we have 60, 72, and 96 that was provided from the class. And now just go go and prove that these are actually the best. And now those kids that go home with a sheet of graph paper and scissors and they're supposed to cut out a bunch of rectangles, they know like these are going to have a lot. Let's see how many we can find. And so it kind of gives a little bit of meaning for why I'm cutting out all these different rectangles. Um, and these are nice big numbers that we might not know the factors just off the top of our heads. Uh, so what we did here is we took the purpose of the game and we brought that social language with the academic language. Um, and we even have um, an um, ESOL teacher in here with us. Um, can I um, call on you, Lynn? I think you put something in on slide 44. Um, so so I was an ESL teacher in Fairfax County, but then now I work at WIDA, which is one of the um, 
language to one of the consortium that works with 41 states. So what I did was I was thrilled um, because I'm trying to understand from math ed educators point of view. So I'm one of the standards developers. And so we're trying to move beyond and I'm going to put it in the text too. we're trying to move beyond like BICS versus CALP, like basic social language versus academic language. And so the slide you just did before is amazing. Um, because it shows that we want an expanded definition of academic language because social language and kids' la resources and their home languages and the culture they bring and your kids' interests, they're all part of the language for math. So it's not just terms on the board. So that's all. But I'm super thrilled to watch you do this. I love that you brought that up because I think so often when students have some obstacle, whether it is language, whether it is I've been placed in this group for whatever reason. So often we might start a class with like, here's all the vocabulary terms you need to know, but they don't necessarily have a reason for it. They don't have a context for it. When if we play games first and say like, what's just the worst number? Um, you know, we have a almost this visceral reaction that's like, oh, I don't want that one. And it can give us purpose. Um, so there's a couple other extensions you could use on this. Um, if this uh, chart could go all the way up to 1,000, what's the best number? Now, I think for many of us, now that's challenging us. We don't necessarily know all of our factors up to 1,000. So we're having to kind of go in the same shoes as our students for that. But it's also helping them to make these generalizations. And I have a resource slide for today. Um, if you are interested in learning more, the ones that are the best, the term for that is called highly composite numbers, super numbers. There is a little um, uh, Euler graph here that looks at numbers and how they're different. Um, and so, you know, this idea of super composite, I linked Wikipedia to it. And there's a lot of upper level math in finding a highly composite number. But the table I'm showing now this is why 60 was so awesome. It's the lowest number with the highest amount of factors. Um, and then we can really go into the math between highly composite numbers, and it goes into a lot of upper level mathematics, um, and it goes into asymptomatic growth and density and more. So it's not just a third grade uh, standard. It really, really stretches. So I hope that that's there for those of you who teach upper grades too. Um, some other things in here, there is a guided practice that I did with my daughter who's in third grade. Um, if you need them to see a little bit more structure with this, they can kind of look at that guided practice one. Um, factors and multiple game on Enrich is fabulous because you just move these little bubbles and you ask yourself, does it have a factor? Does it have a multiple? Well, two is a factor or a multiple. And you can keep trying to make these strings based off of factors and multiples until you can't anymore. Um, so that one's really fun for, for that. Um, and then some of my favorite games, the multi game, the prime time game, and illuminations factor game is another one that fits great with this unit. Um, all right, folks, I had so many ideas that I was so excited to share with you over this. Hope I gave you some. If you have any questions, hang on, ask them. Um, hope these resources are useful for you. And especially if you teach upper grades and you bring this in to have kids really look at numbers, I can't wait to see the, the way that they um, interact with them. All right, folks, happy Mather Days, and I'll hang on for any questions you might have. Hi, Teresa, it's Lydia. Mm -hmm. um, really liked how um, you usually do, you know, like show other people's work and then you talk about it. But today that word wall was, um, I it opened my eye to another way to end uh, group activity. So thanks for that. But I wanted to know how you were able to create the polypath pages, the Mathlon pages with the instruction and link it to the exact, you know, um, rectangle for that number so this did take me like 30 minutes a little bit you know it's kind of a long process i had to do one for each and every single one of them but the process um in case you want to see first of all you have to log in um that will let you save your polypads 
I have a whole bunch of polypads here. Um, <laughs> but what I can do is show you from the very beginning. Um, there should be a way of doing a new one. I don't even know how to do a new one. Let me just go to Mathicon's website. Um, so I'm on a blank one. Um, directions here. I went to the number tiles. If I wanted to do 12, I put a 10, two more. I selected them and then I hit merge tiles and it kind of stuck them all together for me. Um, and then as long as you, it's on merge tiles, the kids can do the, the funky stretching to find the rectangles. Mm -hmm. If it's on split tiles, then they, they start to move stuff around. Um, so I just kept it at merge tiles. Uh, once you've done that, you hit, you give it a name. Notice I'm in the file button. That only appears when you're logged in. Mm -hmm. And I hit save. This is my link. So I just oh, click so that link, link that pop it in the chat. You can share it with people that way. Yeah. Can kids share their work with you? Uh, yes, I don't have a lot of experience in that though. Um, I know we probably have other people either here um, or if you follow them at mathagon.org. I know they can do that, but I don't have I don't, I don't have a step by step way for that yet. Well, no, thanks for that. Just because um, you've used Mathagon multiple times, as you know, you've given that to us as a manipulative that we can use. But I never actually looked into all these other features, so thank you for that. Oh, um, thanks, Amy, for writing that. If you find any others that are off, let me know. I literally did this last night, and um, so uh, I didn't have a chance to check every single one of them. So I will go back and fix 72. And if you see any others, just let me know. I, I fixed 34 this morning. Thank you. Lydia, um, your question was a really good one because my my question was something along the line. When I first learned about Mathagon, it, kids had to log in via like a class code or whatever. And in our district, Mathagon is not part of our data share agreement. And so we are discouraged from using anything that students potentially have would have to go through Clever or Google Classroom where their information will be attached. So I, I'm just curious about as a teacher, if I log in because I have an account, um, if I can just give them a link, that should be safe, yes? I think if you give them the link, it works, but yeah, I am um, still playing with that one. The hundreds chart there should be able to be copied and linked, and I don't think that they would need to log in to play with it. Okay, I think that's a change in Mathagon that um, they did, because okay. before, they have to sign in or or something and I that's when I stop using Mathicon or, or dig into Mathicon because of the process and I can't log in or have students log into Mathicon because of the data share or we don't have a data share agreement with them. You know what else you can do if you so mm -hmm. that was um, if you are playing around with so here's for example this is the one that is the guided practice it was a little little too structured for me you all know i like things to be vague but um so there's the that like over structured one when you play around with it you have your own copy and there's this little download image so even if you want them to play and give you their work they can download that image and then upload it to your learning management system it just saves an image on their computer and I noticed that you have a text box with a question mark, and that's where, as a teacher, you had already inserted the correct answer. And if a student type in whatever answer and it's incorrect, I think they get feedback on it. Yeah, yes? I don't think that I set it up right, like, because I was just tinkering oh. with it. But I know if you get it right, there's confetti. That's what David showed us yes. last week. Um, again, I'm not, I don't have a lot of that experience. Um, I use it as an open sandbox mostly. No, that's cool. Thank you so yeah. much. Teresa, last question before I head out. Yeah. So I was unable to come last weekend, um, but I heard that David, 
um, shared a lot of resources for Mathagon. Would there be a video for it that I can watch? Totally. There I'm sorry. Is. I know you're behind, <laughs> I, but I don't want to pressure you. You have a life, but I'm just, I'm just asking for the future. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, it's, it's totally cool. Um, so I have been, I signed myself up for several other projects within the Virginia Department of Education that have been completely, um, monopolizing my time, but that, that part of the project is finishing up. So yes, I'll be able to put all the recording up um, both on YouTube on my website this is going up today because I have to sit through a meeting today and if they're gonna have me come in on a Saturday for a meeting I'm gonna be doing two <laughs> things at once <laughs> thank you also you don't have to rush through it I was just asking like in general if there would be a video because you know like I I don't know what I'm doing with my life in third grade Teresa so I need time myself so <laughs> thanks so much yeah sure thing Raha, he did the, almost the same presentation last week for the global math department. So if you look up global math department, oh, you okay. can find almost almost the same thing. That's right. Oh, sure. He did say he was doing the same one for that. Maybe you don't even have to do that video. Look at that. <laughs> Thank you, Lisa. All right, folks, have a good one.